Um, Woman Jika Yemen Kondubik Warangi Balak. Welcome back to the lands of the Warangi people. Um, I want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all the elders um, that, well, elder uncle uh, Ringo Terek yesterday um, for giving us that really warm welcome and, and that personal story um, about him growing up on the lands of Wurundjeri and particularly hanging out in Fitzroy, Smith Street, for those that are from Melbourne. That's a really kind of important place um, for the Wurundjeri people. Um, and it was really kind of heartwarming to hear he's, he's sort of got his own mission and plan of how he's sort of building up that um, capacity within his own own people. And uh, I think half an hour after he left, he sent Stephanie an email or called Stephanie to say, hey, you talk to my people and let us know about your project and I'm going to let you know about our project and let's set up a meeting. And that was completely unexpected. So that was really, really fantastic um, that we were able to make those connections just from having him here um, doing that welcome to country. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Um, so today, day two, we're really excited that we're kicking off the day um, focusing on the Aboriginal health, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health strategy of EC Australia. Um, we've got two sessions back to back before morning tea. So strap in, there is a little bit of food, I think still outside. Um, get caffeinated. Uh, we do finish up a little bit earlier than yesterday today. I think we're finishing up at three um, so that people can get home, get on flights, spend some time outside of this room. So it was nice. See, there is sunshine outside. Um, and we'll have very similar format to yesterday. We've got some presentations and then some panels. We've got some roving mics. Um, if there is any questions online, sorry, I've lost our person, Shannon. Oh, Louisa is monitoring questions on the, the chat online. So welcome everybody online. Um, but to start, let's, um, I'll invite Troy up to talk about the Aboriginal health strategy and all the wonderful work that's going on there. Thanks, Troy. Here we are, I think. Oh, no. No, here we are. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, and I guess just before I get going, um, I'm going to um, sort of um, have a little bit of a different approach to start off with. I, I want to um, do some reflections on the last few years of um, uh, working in this role, um, working in the sector, um, also, you know, working during a very testing time um, during COVID. Um, but also trying to engage with the Archo sector, which was, you know, one of the primary focuses um, of my role, um, starting with the Burnett. So um, I'll just have a bit of a chat about that before we get into our work. Um, so I'd just like to start by acknowledging country. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate um, uh, Lisa's sentiments there and um, really welcome to Ringo's um, welcome to country yesterday. Um, didn't know where he was going, but he had a story to tell us and he knew exactly where he was going with it yesterday. And, um, you know, sharing his, I think we had a safe space for him to get up and um, share his story with us. Um, and then also, you know, um, I, I thought it was great that, you know, his pathway took him to acknowledging that, you know, there's funding bodies in this um, room and that, um, you know, he, he hit us all up for some money. So I, I really enjoyed that. And um, that that was really, really great. And, you know, as Elisa said, you know, we've been half hour, he'd already made contact with us to catch up. And um, when I come back down in December, um, we plan on going to give the service that he runs a visit and um, just seeing if there's any opportunities there for integration or um, um, how, how we can support um, such important work um, in, in a very important place for our, our mob in um, uh, Melbourne as well. <clears throat> So um, just on some reflections, I guess yesterday um, was a great day. So I've seen, really seen some of the amazing work that um, my colleagues have, have done, um, you, you know, within the sector and in partnership and collaboration across the sector. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm biased, I, I live in Queensland, but, you know, um, Queensland really shone out. They're, they're very, you know, noisy mob. They travel in, travel in large numbers. I'm sure they're Aboriginal, um, but, you know, um, you know, just the integration across the system there, you know, right from academia with Linda and Andrew Schmernoff's leadership at the University of Queensland, uh, through the local health districts, the, the peer drug user organisations, probation and paroles, the prison systems, 
Um, it's just really, really um, warming to see that, you know, this, this has been, you know, part of the um, approach from EC Australia and that, that catalytic approach um, of, of partnerships. Um, so just um, getting into, you know, the work that even, um, you know, Jackie and the workforce development team done amazing, amazing amounts of work there. Um, and, you know, we're also fortunate to engage um, some Aboriginal programs within that as well, which, which was, um, you know, really testament to the great work and the opportunities that were given there. So I just want to touch on some high level stuff. I'm not going to get too granular with this, um, but also, um, you know, present any data or anything, but just some of the key things that I think that are really, you know, um, impacting Aboriginal communities um, with hepatitis C rates. Um, and the first thing I haven't got on the slide there, but I think is equity. Um, you know, we've really got to have a, a strong e equitable approach to, um, you know, reducing the, the notification rates. Um, as we know that they're widening within the Aboriginal community at the moment, and they're, they're currently at a, a slow upward trend, but, you know, it's an upward trend that, um, you know, we can draw a conclusion that we're not seeing the knock-on effect of treatment as prevention um, within our community. Um, we really need to scale up testing. We nearly re need to scale up um, treatment. Um, obviously, there's the, the, the prisons factor and the social justice factor. Um, you know, um, we've seen within the Stop C study that 80% um, of people that get reinfected within the prisons are Aboriginal. Um, and there's, there's um, one of the sites there that had um, Aboriginal people that were being treated, reinfected, treated, reinfected up to four times. Um, so I think um, that really shows the important um, need for harm minimisation within our prison systems. Um, going back to Queensland again, um, Queensland is the only state in Australia, so leading in Australia, but I could also confidently say internationally um, that, you know, they've enacted in legislation equitable health for First Nations peoples. And I think that's really testament to the Queensland government. And I think it has a knock-on effect and we're just starting to implement that up there as well. Um, so I think um, other state and territories need to catch up um, and have this, um, you know, enacted in legislation that really supports that. And um, the document's called... Um, making tracks um, together. So um, if you want to have a look at that, it's available online um, on Queensland government websites. Um, as I said, the gap's been um, widening over representation um, and increasing IDU. Um, and we've seen a, a quite a um, significant increase in participation of Aboriginal people attending needle syringe programs through the Australian Needle Syringe um, Program Survey. Um, and it's something that I advocate for um, and I, I think it's something strategically ECA Australia needs to work in partnership with um, ABLE and its memberships, um, the federal governments and the state and territory governments um, to advocate for, you know, equitable funding and resources um, of Aboriginal um, workforce within these services. Um, we've seen with, through the It's Your Right campaign um, with workers such as Colin, David and, and the likes that were there over the, the years um, in the peer project um, that, you know, we had really strong participation um, with, through Colin and David and the likes. Um, and it really shows when you invest in Aboriginal workers that, you know, you get a stronger, well, not a strong, but an enhanced engagement with Aboriginal communities. So um, I just wanted to finish on that note as well. Um, so just through some of the consultations and yarnings with people, um, we know that workforce is an issue. Um, we always hear um, from our sector that, you know, competing priorities. And we know that, um, you know, we're working in the background with closing the gap. Um, and that bloodborne viruses and STIs um, are not mentioned within that um, national reform agreement. Um, so that's quite competing. Just this year, the federal government included a new set of indicators, which is to um, on the national key performance indicators, which all AMSs and funded Indigenous Australian health programs um, are required to report against. Um, and I think it's a really missed opportunity because they're only um, going to measure chlamydia and gonorrhea and, and hepatitis um, has been left out of that. Um, we're hearing from them there's insufficient knowledge among healthcare workers, um, right from some of the research we've done in the sector, from um, doctors, um, you know, uh, gaps in knowledge, um, to even stigma from doctors working within Aboriginal uh, medical services towards people who inject drugs and also people living with hepatitis C. Um, massive reliance on um, locum GPs at, at a lot of services, even within urban settings um, where you would think that doc, um you know, these services will be able to have a steady workforce. They're still relying on local workforce and a high turnover of GPs. Um, and so ideally we'd like to see uh, multidisciplinary teams that are trained and educated um, to address hepatitis C in this sector. 
Um, obviously, there's the intersectionality with um, discrimination and racism and shame. Um, I won't talk too much on that. We all sort of understand that. Um, and, you know, we think that Archo is the, you know, the most well-placed um, organisation to provide culturally safe care, um, but they may not be preferred, um, you know, service for all people. Um, but what we are finding, when we create that safe environment within Archos, and we've seen through some of the research projects that James Ward is doing, such as the Scale C, we're getting decent numbers of cohorts of people that are at risk of hepatitis C um, or that are injecting drug use. So I think that if we, um, you know, on the back of some of the health promotion campaigns that we're doing and will be doing, um, this may be an opportunity for the services to, um, you know, integrate hepatitis C care uh, much more effectively into their services. <clears throat> Um, comorbidities, as I mentioned earlier, very complex um, health and social needs. Um, we know and we get feedback from a lot of the, the doctors and the Aboriginal health workers and nurses that, you know, um, these people um, who identify as, as peer users within the organisations, um, you know, have other issues that um, they prioritise at the time, such as mental health, um, imprisonment and also homelessness. Um, once again, the Archo is the best place, but it's still difficult to address. Um, you need to have the strong relationships with communities, um, culturally safe care, flexible models um, that are also child friendly. That's a lot of the feedback that we're getting as well. Um, and potential to integrate um, in, um, financial incentives into and using peer based models, but testing these within the environment of Aboriginal community controlled um, health services as well. Um, again, they're just high incarceration rates. We don't need to know that. We all know about the massive disparity and the gross over representation of Aboriginal people in Australia. And I think to address this, we need to address the big word and the big letter, which is the R word, racism within um, the Australian, um, you, you know, legal system and fraternity, um, but right through the Australian society. Um, and um, then we, we may see to start to see some impacts and reduction um, and reinvestment, not only of funds, but reinvestment of time and programs um, instead of um, incarcerating people. Um, there was a article yesterday that says, you know, we need to start fixing kids' health, not locking them up um, in the Nacho Communique. And I think that's um, a real testament as well to, to the type of work that we need to be doing. So we need um, provision of sterile injection equipment, plus also transition to community programs, um, which we heard about yesterday from Dorrit and the team at Quinn. Um, surveillance and monitoring, um, there's still, you know, God, I've been working in Aboriginal health um, 28 years now. Um, we're talking about this back in the 1990s um, of Indigenous recording. Um, we're still not getting good, um, you know, Indigenous status recording within um, you, you know, at service level, at data pathology request, and um, it has a knock-on effect into Australian surveillance reports and surveillance system as well. Um, there are opportunities um, for service level testing and treatment rates um, and the disaggregation of Aboriginal data within both the access um, and the Atlas network, even though the Atlas network also is um, a, a, an Aboriginal sentinel surveillance with around 40 Aboriginal um, community health service that uh, function in that. So um, we want to improve the recording of digital status. Um, and as I said there, and um, opportunities for collaboration between the two networks as well to, um, you know, build a better, um, I, I guess, service level um, care cascade across the Australian primary health care systems. Um, possible service level activities, um, this very pragmatic type of approach, um, localized CQI activities, um, development service level um, care cascades, develop data extraction formulas um, for PIMS, um, for the patient information management systems and data extraction tools, um, utilizing such things as PENCATs. Most Aboriginal health services have access to a free license of PENCAT um, and they have a good suite of STI and BBV indicators within them. Um, supporting them with PDCA cycles um, and also having a micro elimination approach at a local service level in Aboriginal communities. I think lots of little wins can have a really good impact and a strong impact on um, reducing the numbers of Aboriginal people. So um, we can have a look at active patients, but then also have a look at inactive patients. Um, a lot of services um, within the Archer sector mostly look at active patients because that's what they're required to report upon. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity there um, to possibly re-engage people that, you know, especially young men that just may not have been um, you know, that um, three, three times in two years that keeps you as an active patient. So there's lots of opportunities there to, um, you know, re-engage with people and do better case finding for that. Um, increasing the role of the Aboriginal health worker, um, you know, utilising already existing chronic disease um, principles in um, relation to hepatitis C testing and treatment and management and um, develop local um, treatment pathways. Um, so better integration between the ARCHO sector 
Um, I use local health districts because I'm a New South Wales person, but I know other states use hospital health services and the likes, um, and also local liver clinics that sit within them. Um, so that was just a quick reflection um, of some of the um, feedback we've been getting over the last couple of years. Um, and we're going to go on now to talk about um, our It's Your Right campaign, Aboriginal um, campaign burst. And we touched on a little bit yesterday, but um, just want to give a little bit more of an in-depth, um, I suppose, uh, presentation of that here today. So um, I'll get on into that right now. Excuse me. So back with, um, with the National Reference Group um, from Emily Adamson's campaign, um, the Itch or Right campaign, as it's known now, um, we um, surveyed, um, we, we took the, uh, what do you call it, the, um, our, our assets and messages um, to, to the services to test with their peers. Um, and um, we got, as I said, 25% Aboriginal participation back from them. Um, so we went and developed some new campaign messages and um, quickly, I guess, um, built an Aboriginal um, reference group of Aboriginal peers that were currently working within the sector. And at the time, there were there were three three Aboriginal people that we could identify working across um, Able and its memberships. And um, Colin will talk about them today. But um, one was Colin Miklo, who had moved on from the sector, but he's still engaged through IUI. Um, the other one was Jemmy Forrester, who worked at um, the Alice Springs office in NTAC, um, and John Vanden Duggan, who many of you may know from many years ago from the work that he's done um, in Canberra, uh, but he was working at um, Hepatitis ACT at the time. Um, so we had all state and territories participate. Um, we wanted to capture what appears to our Aboriginal audience, um, and especially the people who inject drugs, um, explore language, and identify if our messages were meaningful. Um, and assist in selecting new introduced messages. So um, Colin will have some slides today that will show the original messaging that we had um, and Queensland and T um, and I think South Australia were the first three states that implemented the campaign and they only got the, the first um, campaign messages that were developed for non-Aboriginal people. <clears throat> and then the next implementation round had the new messaging in there as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so we had 87 um, completed the survey out of 92 respondents, 20, 25% were Aboriginal. Um, and that's just the breakdown. I won't go through that. You can all quickly read that. Um, uh, people who participated uh, within um, the survey. So the It's All Right was a response to that feedback. Um, as I said, we convened that working group. Um, Aboriginal owned design agency, We Are 27, we're engaged um, as a third party via Enigma, our advertising agency. Um, and what we did do was they developed the concepts and the artwork. Um, and we, along with them in that co-design process, we, we introduced the new messages. Um, it was done in a very um, rapid approach. Um, we had a really good timeline set out um, and it was, we identified the need to be able to catch up with the impending rollouts of, of the It's Your Right campaign. Otherwise, we just would have missed that and have to have another separate rollout altogether, which we um, didn't have the funds to do. Um, so working with the group and also with, um, after some um, work with the group, uh, Ricky Salam from We Are 27 came up with two, two key themes. One was bloodlines and one was other, um, was keep country strong. And both of them really resonate with Aboriginal community. Um, the consensus due to the nature of hepatitis C and its transmission um, and its understanding within the sector and using that, I suppose, that duality of that understanding between Aboriginal people <coughs> and people who inject drugs um, and the virus, um, we had a strong consensus to go with the bloodlines um, theme. Um, a thematic artwork was then developed um, to um, meet, meet, that, um, meet that theme of, of the campaign that we're going to use. Um, so this is just some of the online um, tools that we used um, to, I guess, workshop with the group quite quickly. Um, you can see there we had um, five key questions um, and the people that have used these type of tools, you know that the larger ones are the ones that were used the most um, and then they sort of reduce back in size to the less used words. Um, but I guess in reflection of that, there was something really positive for me that come out of this process was when I talk about, you know, words <clears throat> that describe 
um, family and health. And that from working in health too much, I've tried to steer away from that def deficit approach. But working with the peers, you know, like when we ask, you know, what what's family? You know, some of them said, oh, family's hectic. You know, it, you know, and we're getting the true essence of what co-design is all about, you know, and not us coming in with my pre-described sort of, um, you know, look, looking at health because we've, you know, I've been trained and um, that for years to flip that deficit into a um, strength-based approach. So working with the group using this model was um, really powerful and they came through and that's how we developed our themes. Um, so some of the survey feedback, um, I've only got a couple of minutes, um, is... Um, you know, you can read that. We encourages me to seek testing and treatment. Um, this was in response to this um, uh, asset here. We need this at all my GP clinics to uh, make it less shame to talk about. I love this poster. It's bright, using Aboriginal colours, um, and it's 100% correct. It's talking to me in language I understand, um, and it's your right talking to a peer stands out for me. Um, so just in closing, um, there's another Aboriginal health campaign that will be de developed um, specifically for Aboriginal people that access Aboriginal community child health services. Um, this will be developed uh, over the um, coming three or four months um, with implementation throughout 2023. Um, we'll be in collaboration with um, Archo sector. Um, we've got Nacho have come on board with us, Aqua are on board, um, Varcho. So we've got our state and territory affiliates um, plus select um, uh, local Aboriginal health service as well. So we should have a good mix from um, community based right up to our national um, peak body in Canberra. Um, we've got uh, co-design workshops will um, occur. We will look at media assets, um, you know, explore, you know, the rollout and implementation of it. You know, will it be social media? Um, do our services want um, to develop some videos for Tonic um, Television? Um, and do they want um, advertising for out of house advertising and around their local communities as well? Um, these are some of the terms I use from being involved, out of house advertising. Um, it's great. <laughs> um, explore, um, if resources will need traditional place-based languages, um, especially around the NT and, and some parts of Northwest New South Wales and um, um, Northern Queensland as well. Um, and there's an opportunity, as I said, to link the artwork and some of the messaging through, uh, maybe as a starting point, this will be one of the first decisions the national um, reference group will make once we convene. Um, and um, there's opportunity there also to link in and provide the resources to uh, the 10 archos that are participating in the Kirby point of care testing rollout as well. So um, that brings me to an end for that one. And I think um, we've got Colin Michelo, um, who's going to just give us a, uh, I guess, presentation. Colin works for IUI now, first engaged with us, as you all know, um, with Quinn through the pre-project um, work that he was doing there. Um, and has been involved um, from the early days and right through um, the development of the mainstream Mitchell Wright campaign for the, the peer drug user organizations and also this Aboriginal um, burst as well. And will also be involved in the Archo one well now that he's working for an Archo. So uh, very fortunate. Please welcome Colin. I'm a hobbit, so sorry, but you can't hear me. Um, <clears throat> so I actually first started, um, Amanda Gavassi, they invited me back to work at Quinn. So I actually started working at Quinn as a student and then just casual work and I work with Teagues and all the rest of it. So I love everyone that's here right now, seeing my face up here. Um, so when we first started, um, so I came back for the peer project. So I'm a person with lived experience. Um, I've been marginalized, been discriminated against, you know, even myself going into AMS as myself general practitioners, so you weren't always able to get the care that you need for your mental health, even about blood moon viruses. When we first started the um, Eat Your Right campaign, the, it almost felt like for me, sorry for all the other peers, but um, I was the only First Nations person, you know, in that first uh, round. And I could see from the very start that it was just business as usual, saying the same uh, the same language. It's another poster, which is, it is coming from the peer perspective. The one thing um, that you can see from here, is um, we, even with the words get clear well in the gear, it does resonate with um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community as well. Uh, the, um, the words weren't really resonating with the elders in the community. So the um, older people that may be not accessing NSPs and um, not going into like, you know, just the traditional services where they can get um, clean equipment. Using the artwork, it um it looked really deadly, and um, we actually did the surveys, and I deliberate so twenty five percent of those things were probably just all from. Yep. 
sorry, it was actually supposed to do this like a really cool thing and like just go through it, but I'm just gonna keep them going back and forth like this so you can see it. So just pretend that that's, that's not me. Um, so as we keep on going, um, I actually spoke to M. So M has done an amazing job like facilitating this. When I'd spoken to them on the side that it felt like um, my voice, you know, wasn't really being heard. And, you know, I'm, I'm a really loud speaker, but I do like to listen to. So normally when I'm quiet, I'm really I'm contemplating on how we can do be respectful because the peers that we have in this place have worked very, very, very hard. I've been doing this for 20 years and I don't know how long they've been doing it for. And, you know, the stigma and discrimination that they've had through that, especially with um, in a clinical setting as well. So it's quite a lot of stigma around that. Um, once we got into this thing here, I'm just going to go like that so you can see it. Um, when we actually got the um, the First Nations um, round, you'll start seeing that um, the, the colours are really vibrant. I also um, spoke to Ricky Salam and said that we have um, brother, boys and sister girls, so the LGBTQI community are really, really important as well. So we keep on missing out on them and everything that we do. They are um, like we're 3% of the population, but then they're the most marginalized and overrepresentation in custodial services and not accessing um, quite a lot of the services. And there's a lot of barriers for them accessing um, safe spaces. If you go out to Burley, you'll meet, uh, you know, uh, you, get, you meet Teagues, you get to meet Isha down in Bowen Hills. You've got probably the deadliest peers sitting around here that are really, really uh, connected to culture, but that don't identify as Aboriginal. So you can be, um, you know, as uh, culturally appropriate as you want, but you don't know what it's like to live as a First Nations person or a peer or a sister boy or brother boy or sister girl. When you see these messages, it actually starts a yarn. So you can say, hey, look, I feel deadly. The words um, that Ricky Slum actually put together was, um, you know, we've been here for 65,000 years all the way back into the dream time. So what we don't need is not for you to save us. You just need to tool us with a way that we can access and just move those barriers. The connection to um, to our land is still like here and it is every day. And our connection to our bloodlines is really important too. So it actually resonates even better when Ricky Slam was able to do the post, um, the postcard as well. So not only did um, the people that did the um, messaging uh, that helped us through the um, the surveys that we did. Um, it really, really hit home. So I actually um, took it out to um, remote and regional areas. So I did that off my own buck. Um, they actually paid me a little bit extra too for um, a couple of the ones I did. I did too, too many surveys, but um, I think it was really important to get the community leaders, the First Nations representation from, um, you know, Sherberg out in Rockhampton and people from communities that are normally marginalized and not even represented um, in these spaces as well it's really hard to have um you know like all you deadly people you know from everywhere that you are there's probably you know one or two people from you know very remote or regional areas we've got deadly brother boy here from Cairns. um but i'm gonna like uh just say that it's really really important that we have um like training ships to upskill our peers also or like people that are accessing our services um, I think Amanda Gavassi said it best, you know, like when we do these funding rounds, we need to be able to support the organizations to keep the workers that you have. So I'm pretty fucking deadly, but the other workers that are out there too, like you need, you know, Amanda Gavassi in every single organization to make sure that you have, you know, other peer workers deliberately in your service. So identified workers, employ them, keep them, retain them. The reason why I had left um, Quinn was my, I was only working two days, actually left my primary job to come back to Quinn and I burnt through my own money because I'm so passionate about, um, you know, this type of service and um, having academia as well. Um, Morris did a really deadly job, wherever Morris is, um, with the uh, with the surveys with the people that were um, during that, um, that first initial um, campaign when we rolled it out as a peer worker when I was at Quinn. Um, I'm just going to keep on going through this so you can just see all the deadly photos. But as you go, um, these when you put these up in the um, in your services, they don't exclude um, you know dominant culture, multicultural people. It includes everyone. So when you do deliberate um, messaging for First Nations people, then resonates with them. It can actually start a conversation, and it even opens up a way for you to say, "Hey, look, I may not know that, but let's find out together. Let's use, let's go get that postcard. Let's have a little yarn about it, and then maybe that shame and stigma, discrimination. You know, we can all heal together." So. I'm going to go because I can't see M behind anyone, but I'm going to leave these photos up here. And um, yeah, Bill Deadly is really good too. So um, actually just one thing, the words um, that the, um, you know, that the other peers had was um, really, really important too. So um, the, the deadly word, people didn't want to use it in the first reference group. And 
my my word is, you know, like we are marginalised, so a lot of people inject drugs around and um, in custody settings, you're part of our family. So a lot of the time you have got an Aboriginal friend, you know those words aren't, um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, if you inject it's deadly. It's not, it's deadly, like it's deadly, it's okay to feel, you know, don't be shame. get retreated, get retreated, get retreated, get retreated. So anyways, I'm going to go sit down over here. If you've got any questions, just do whatever you've got to do. Uh, thanks, Colin, for that. Um, I'll just quickly talk to this one as well. So um, this was a postcard size um, postcard um, that, you know, had one of the messages on one side, but it, um, we also wanted to explain um, what the artwork meant and the messaging behind it as well. So um, I'm not sure how widely they've been taken up at services, but um, yeah, that's something that we thought was important as well, just to, um, you know, extend the messaging out there. Beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, um, and thank you to our funding body, um, the Australian Government, um, Department of Health for that, um, Department of Health and Aged Care, I'm led to believe it's called now. So um, thank you, I know Shweta's in the room here. Um, Shweta, Stuart, um, Penny and the team. Um, thank you very much. Um, so going on to one of our um, larger projects we're doing um, with an Aboriginal community child health organisation. Um, which is the Bulgaroo Health System Strengthening Program for STIs and bloodborne viruses. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that they couldn't have a staff member here today um, from Northern New South Wales. So we're presenting this um, on behalf and in partnership um, with the Bulgaroo um, executive and staff. Um, and just like to acknowledge their chief executive officer, uh, Mr. Scott Monaghan, um, also Elisa Badrana. Um, M Dr. Emma Bevan, um, Sophie Clusterman from Ashham, um, and also Shannon Christensen from, from our team, and many more people that have been involved and sit on um, local uh, reference groups um, in some of the stuff that we'll explain to you here in this presentation. So again, just like to, to acknowledge country, um, um, but in this acknowledgement, I'd really like to acknowledge my ancestral lineage back to country where this project is, um, which is Bundjalung um, Nation. Um, I'm a Widjibal Wyabal man, um, which is a clan of the Bundjalung Nation, um, which is based around um, the Lismore to Kyogal to Nimbin region. Um, and yeah, just really want to acknowledge um, the footprints that I walk in from my ancestors um, um, that have led me here today. And um, I, I guess also acknowledge the amazing work that they've done um, in advocating locally uh, for social justice, for land rights. We're just about to um, have the High Court of New South Wales come and have our native title determination um, given to our people. Um, so um, it's great acknowledgement um, to know that um, we're being acknowledged and have a continuation to land um, in that region. Um, so just quickly, Bolganaru Medical Aboriginal Corporation, um, a bit of a history around that. Bolganaru um, was established in 1990. It was in response to um, rising numbers of the local Aboriginal community presenting um, to local health um, districts with you know, asbestos related respiratory diseases. Um, there was a 1984 release of a New South Wales government report titled The Effects of Asbestos on the Bayougal Community. Bayougal is a small Aboriginal, discrete Aboriginal community um, to the northwest of Grafton on New South Wales, the Clarence River for people that know the region. Um, and they had that first generation of people that were starting to present um, with, with these, you, you know, um, life threatening illnesses. Um, so it's a local Aboriginal uh, medical service. Um, and it is a member of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales, but also um, NARCHO as well, the National Aboriginal Community Child Health Organisation. And it's a primary healthcare service that initiated and operated by local Aboriginal people in response to um, that, that asbestos crisis that they could call that in the region. Um, it provides holistic, comprehensive care um, and wraparound um, primary healthcare services to the local Aboriginal communities that ser services. Um, it has approximately 5,800 active patients across um, the three clinical sites, um, and it has really been impacted late um, in 2021 and early 2022 with COVID outbreaks in northern New South Wales, um, and also the impact of the recent floods in the region, um, in the region as well as also had um, knock-on effects with staffing and, um, and this project as well, and it's um, impacted on some of our timelines. Um, and we've just sent in a variation of contract to um, the federal government to have that extended. Um, so that's a, the regional map from up there. Um, Bolganaroo first started off in Grafton um, as a standalone Aboriginal medical service. 
It now functions as a large regional health service. Um, its footprints cover um, the traditional people of the, the Yagil, the um, Gumbengi, um, and most of the Bundjalung Nation, um, bar in Lismore, Ballina, and the Byron Bay region. Um, so its borders go from the Clarence River in the south to the Tweed River in the north. Um, and um, it has clinical sites at Grafton, South Grafton, McLean, Casino, and also the Tweed Heads. Um, and the Tweed Heads site um, operates as Boogawina GP practice, and the girls around here would know the service well as well from um, that community. Um, the casino clinic also provides clinical outreach services to um, three discrete Aboriginal communities at Tabulum, Muli Muli and Korokai, um, respectively, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the Grafton site provides um, outreach services to the communities of Bayugal and um, what's sort of new Bayugal now, but it's called Malabugama. But um, we've still got a lot of um, old mob that won't leave the old community where there's still asbestos tailings that have been, um, you know, ash felted in uh, and over and they still um, come out every now and then. So um, it's still a bit of a risk around there. We've just started to see the second generation. So children of the workers in their minds um, have started to present and we're starting to lose that what um, the second generation um, um, affected from that from that now, what we know is um, now very dangerous um, mine. Um, okay, I'm doing joint presentation with Emma here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in May, um, 2021, um, a competitive funding round, um, from the Department of Health and Aging became available for STIs and bloodborne viruses in Aboriginal communities. Um, we found out quite late. We had around, um, six, seven working days to get a concept together, get, find a partner organization, um, and, um, get, get the application in. So, um, we sort of took three distinct ideas from learnings that we had across um, EC Australia, um, which was an incentives-based program, a CQI from some of the work that Jackie's done, um, and also um, a testing and treatment campaign, integrating point of care testing um, into the service as well. Um, you know, looking at the model that we put together, we knew that we would need a third partner. Um, and we also approached Ashen to come on board. Um, Bolgana rule very, um, you know, up front at the start, and they had um, lost a lot of their um, senior management over the, the the previous couple of years and the impact of COVID. Um, and they said that um, they stated that you know they they had minimal capacity to take full leadership of such a such a large program. So um, we agreed that we will provide that technical and some of the administrative support um, to the service as well. And they take carriage of the funds and contract us to do that, um, and also Ashen to provide the. Um, workforce development component. So um, we first approached to, um, from, um, you know, our point of view, just to do eliminate a micro elimination program within them. Um, but with, I guess, um, you know, expertise and the knowledge from the CEO, um, he, he identified that he wanted to broaden the scope and also include STIs um, to the project as well. Um, you know, Bolganaru, they currently perform you know, much better than the national averages in areas such as immunisation, um, chronic disease management and preventative health. Um, and, but they really want to have a stronger focus on um, viral hepatitis and also um, sexually transmitted infections um, amongst the young people in the community. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Emma, um, Dr. Evan Bevan. She's a public health registrar with us at the Burnett and um, has been working closely with me on this project and the Bolganaroo team. Um, for the past 12 months, pretty much. Yeah. Really? Welcome, yeah. Emma. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Um, <laughs> so the goals of this project are to increase the STI and BBV testing and treatment among a large um, regional Aboriginal community controlled health service, as Troy has already sort of talked about. Um, so the aim to do this by bringing together a wealth of cultural and clinical expertise that already exists across a broad range of areas at Bolganaroo um, and support the provision of higher quality, culturally responsive and safe STI and BBV care to Aboriginal people in the region. Um, the ultimate goal is to create a model that can be used across other health areas within Bolganaroo and a framework which can be shared with and used by other archers to improve their STI and BBV care as well. Um, so this is just an overview of the structure of the program, which we've, um, it's been structured into three phases um, and each has been developed in a co-design um, and will be implemented through a co-design process. 
So each phase um, will also be guided by a reference group, which is made up of staff from Bolganaru, a community member with lived experience, as well as representatives from EC Australia and Asham. At a higher level, there's also a, a governance group um, that includes the Bolganaru CEO. So the three phases are STI and BBB education campaign, um, which has um, been run by Asham. Um, phase two will include uh, a, the development of a, a CQI, continuous quality improvement fra framework. And phase three um, will include the delivery of community STI and BBB testing campaigns as well. Um, an evaluation plan has also been developed to occur alongside these phases as well. So I'll just go into a bit more detail of each, each of these. So the first phase of the program um, is an STI and BBB training program, which will be provided by ASHAM. The courses have been adapted to fit the needs of the clinics in the local context through a reference group. Um, and there will be two um, three and a half hour courses that will be pre presented to the staff. One will focus on sexual health um, and the second will focus on hepatitis C, both targeted for people working in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander healthcare services. They'll um, involve a focus on staff knowledge and awareness of culturally appropriate approaches to increasing testing and coverage rates for STIs and BBVs, and will be attended by staff across all three of the clinical sites. Um, we'll include a mix of Aboriginal health workers and nurses and GPs as well. Um, the courses have been accredited um, for CPD um, credits by RACGP, the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, and the National Association for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workers and Practitioners, or Nazi WIP. Um, it also has pending accreditation with ACN, um, the Austra Australian College of Nursing. Um, and excitingly, we've, we've got plans to um, run these over two days at the end of this month um, and they'll be presented by representatives from the local sexual health clinics and GPs from Aboriginal community health services who have extensive experience in the management of STIs and BBVs in the local region. Um, phase two of the project will be the development of implementation um, of a quality improvement process um, throughout Bolganaru, and it will have a focus on improving clinical indicators for STIs and BBVs. Um, we'll use um, uh, data extracted from the clinical management software using PenCat. Um, we've been kindly offered access to resources through partnerships at ASHAM and the Beyond the Sea project as well. Um, and this phase is currently in the development process and we're having regular meetings with practice managers, um, a data officer from Bolganaru and, um, and us at ECA as well. So we've started having those meetings and we're planning to travel up in the next few weeks to meet staff and socialize the project and strengthen connections with the, the staff on the floor at the clinics. Um, this will already build on um, processes that already exist ad hoc at, um, at Bolganaru. Um, they already have some CQI activities that go on um, and obviously have some expertise already in this area. Um, and, um, but it will assist in integrating it into their everyday practices at the clinic. Um, and will also help to inform the, phase, the third phase of the program. Um, this is the community testing campaigns. Uh, and this is planned to begin in 2023. The final design and structure of this will be determined by members of the project um, reference group and will include representatives from Bolganaru clinical sites and community members. Um, it will involve health prom promotion campaigns, which um, will like might, may consist of community events and outreach testing, um, incentives programs, with, you know, um, building on models that have been shown to be successful in other settings. Um, and um, will we'll help determine if these are appropriate for um, and successful in an Aboriginal community controlled health service setting. Um, we hope that there'll be opportunities also to integrate point of care testing into these processes um, to improve the accessibility of testing for both BBVs and STIs across the community. An evaluation plan has also been developed to run alongside all three of these phases and will utilize both qualitative and quantitative methods. Um, the, Phase one, there'll be a post-course survey and focus group discussions, um, which will be reimbursed for um, staff who volunteer to attend these. Um, the clinical indicator data, which will be used for the CQI process, will also be collected and used to evaluate the impact of the program at the clinical level. And focus group discussions and surveys will be used to gather feedback from staff um, throughout the process as well, as well as client um, snapshot surveys, which will occur during the community health campaigns as well. Um, we have ethics approval from uh, for, for the evaluation from the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales, or AHNMRC. And I think Troy was going <laughs> to go about. 
I'll just finish off on one of the last slides. So just some achievements to date and a um, bit of the process that's gone on with Bulgaru. And um, initially when the funding um, was announced, um, we convened a executive level um, reference group that ex existed of um, Asham staff, um, uh, ECA staff, Lisa Badrana, Mark Stuve, Jackie Richmond, and that were involved early on in the early days, um, and also Josh Dorr, um, and the Chief Executive Officer from Bolganaru sat on there um, as the representative of Bolganaru. Um, we were having these meetings quite regularly every month. Um, we're now having them every six weeks. Um, so we've had um, numerous meetings over the times. Um, we've um, got an evaluation plan developed, um, especially for the first phase um, through ASHAM. Um, to evaluate the impact of the training packages. Um, and we have, as we said, we've got ethics approval for that. So we can um, not only undertake the evaluations, ensure that it's culturally appropriate, um, but also to um, have some publication outputs um, along the way as we, we um, get some tentative outcomes and the likes. Um, we've got a co-design reference group, um, which was convened. Um, these have um, currently adapted the STI and the bloodborne virus training packages with local clinicians. Um, and we also had a local um, person with a lived experience who had um, been through hepatitis C treatment, had a, um, a history of injecting drug use, and has also um, spent many years in prisons as um, a young person. Um, um, so she was she was really valuable as well. Um, we've developed local partnerships with the local um, HARP units across two um, local health districts within New South Wales, the Mid North Coast, and also the Northern New South Wales local health district. Um, and that will enable um, not only service level partnerships, but um, also some of their staff will be um, the local um, facilitators and preventers of the training packages. Um, we've had site visits, so both and Emma have been up most. Um, and had visits with the um, staff. I feel it's very important as an Aboriginal person um, for Aboriginal non-Aboriginal institutes and researchers to, um, I always like to use the motto, we do people before we do work. Um, so I've really um, been very vocal about that. You know, we need to get up there as much as we can um, with our limited funds that we have um, and just go and familiarise ourselves with the staff um, especially when we've done a lot of this stuff all on Zoom over the last um, 18 months as well. Um, learn about local culture. We've done um, with Margaret and Elisa came up as well. Um, we've done a couple of local cultural visits to um, some local Aboriginal historical um, walks that they've got on the beach. Um, I took them to one of our young men's, um, which had approval to, um, to, to um, one of the um, existing Bora rings that, that is still in the Lennox Head region as well. Um, so, yeah, we're just about to commence the CQI process and um, we've just started meetings with the data custodian of the organisation um, and agreed on PENCATs, um, STIs and BBB indicators, um, and um, have commenced regular practice meetings with the um, practice managers as well. So what happened with the development of, um, you know, that the executive level um, partnership, um, the executive level reference group and also the the um, working group to assist in the adaptation of the training packages um, and Bolganaru just coming back to normal service delivery um, and having staff back on board um, they've lost a lot of their internal feedback loops and, and clinical meetings because they're not having people come together um, within small spaces um, yet so um, a, a lot of them you know, um, you know plan monthly meetings um, had fallen down um, so reference group meeting um, reference group members weren't feeding up or down the information that they were taking on within the reference group. So we'll find an, um, a little breakdown in communication there. So um, when we went and done our visits, we'll talk with the practice managers and they were like, what, what project? So the CEO was well versed in it and the staff down below, but the, the middle management um, were not aware of it. So we've um, sort of had to, I guess, acknowledge that and we've just um, commenced them new meetings. So um, that's very important to have the, you know, middle management on board as well. Um, just like to acknowledge the Commonwealth Department of Health and Aged Care. Um, big acknowledgements and shout out to the Ashen team, um, Phoebe, Michelle Kwok, um, uh, Sophia um, Klusterman, um, Shelley Kerr, and the support that they've given us um, through this um, as, a, as our contracted third partner. Um, the Bolganaroo board, management and staff, a big um, shout out to them. Um, we've been trying to get to a board meeting, um, but, you know, with all the disruptions up there, it's been, uh, it's been really hard. Um, and more recently, we've, um, you know, ha had a lot of sorry business up there as well. Um, we just lost one of our founding members. I um, really like to acknowledge her as well, Annie Lillian. Um, and thanks to all the support internally from the EC Australia team. Um, also the Mid-North Coast Local Health Districts and our community representative, um, Peter Walker. 
Um, so that brings us to the end of that one. Right? No claps. <laughs> Trying to get back some time here. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've got our next presenter, um, which dovetails well into this presentation, um, Ms. Phoebe Schroeder from Ashem. Um, and this is some work um, Ashem and we co bridged with um, many years ago, which was the development of the training package we're now using at Bolganaroo. So um, Phoebe's going to talk about the um, development of that, the piloting of that, and some of the findings from the evaluation we've done um, with the workforce. So please welcome Phoebe. paper notes so excuse my shuffling sorry ah oh, thank you um so my name is Phoebe Schroeder I'm the acting hepatitis B program manager at Ashem and I would just like to acknowledge the lands that are on today uh the Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation and also the lands that I live and often work from the lands of the Terra Marigal people and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded um, just a disclosure of interest that the education package I'll be discussing was industry sponsored um, in line with our sponsorship policy. They had no input into the content, tone or emphasis of the final product. Um, and just some special acknowledgements before I begin, um, just some individuals who are instrumental in this, who just, we wouldn't have been able to do this without them. So thank you to Adam Howie, who was a key consultant for our M&E methodology and ran the majority of our yarning circles. Um, thanks to Shazza Taylor, who's an Aboriginal health educator and was key in our reframing of the course following the pilot. Thanks to Troy, who we all know, who provided a lot of guidance throughout the project. And someone I forgot to send, um, put on the slide before I sent it across was Dr. Kerry Hall, who's a lecturer with the First Peoples Health Unit Griffith University um, and a registered Aboriginal health practitioner. Kez was with us for every course we ran and provided so much feedback that helped us to make the course stronger. Um, so Troy's provided a bit of background, which saves me some time because I've only got 15 minutes. So I'm going to try and keep things really high level. Um, I encourage everyone to reach out to me in an email or just after this, if you do have any questions, I won't be able to get into, I guess, everything. Um, I will just say that um, this really did come about, though, from the fact that there was an identified lack of need of hep C training for Aboriginal Industrial Islander health workers. Despite the fact that they play an incredibly vital role in the provision of hepatitis services to Aboriginal communities, they act as a connection between community and health services, and they embed cultural safety and models of service delivery to improve community engagement and the provision of care. So just a big shout out to that group that um, we, we wouldn't have the results that we're having without, without that profession. Um, the course was developed as an online course. I won't go into much detail on that, but that that was decided in response to COVID-19 um, with our steering committee. And just for ease, um, I'll be speaking about this course in terms of its pilot and then more of an implementation phase separately. So just to, to briefly outline the development, um, we did convene a steering committee and include people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people who work in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander medical services. The steering committee shaped our learning outcomes, our course program, our format. They provide suggestions for reviewers and presenters, criteria for the attendees and the presenters. Um, and just a couple of things to stress that were really important with the way that we, we started our development, which was they stressed, of course, the need for the development delivery to be Aboriginal led, but they also stressed the importance of taking time and to not, um, but just, just to always add a bit of time and to make sure that you're having that time for those um, important discussions and important relationships. So they outlined that we really need to be reconsidering our initial time frame, and suggested that we actually built in a pilot stage first so that we had ample time to actually enact the feedback that we did receive from the pilot. So based on this, and this is a very broad timeline of obviously, but um, based on the, receive, the feedback received from stakeholders from the steering committee, we developed a timeline on screen where we did pilot in December and then gave ourselves a solid six months to be able to work through what needed to be amended to make the course as strong as it could be. So um, in terms of the monitoring and evaluation, um, we did consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders experienced in both monitoring and evaluation to develop methodology that allowed us um, to have data to be collected using both an online survey as well as through yarning circles. Um, a number of guiding principles were established and 
while we did um, make some changes to our evaluation um, framework, these ones do still all hold true, which was that surveys really needed to avoid exam style questions. So make sure that there was no feeling that people were being assessed. Um, the evaluation cycle needs to be really transparent with questions only asked if they are meaningful and relevant. Um, and we made sure as well that all stakeholders and anyone who participated in the course and provided um, any kind of feedback was offered the final evaluation report so that they did understand how valuable their feedback was and what the purpose of their feedback was. Um, it should be an iterative process, so making sure that we have time to, to actually amend our monitoring evaluation methodology to amend all parts of the training. And insight generating, which I don't think I wrote, um, which is really just around the fact that our evaluation shouldn't just be about understanding if the course went well, um, but rather um, actual areas for improvement as well. And the consultation indicated that we should be using uh, yarning circles with informal conversations led by individuals identifying as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. I won't go into much detail on the pilot, kind of the initial monitoring methodology. Um, um, but aside from saying that we did have both online surveys and yarning circles, the surveys originally were done at three time points and the yarning circles um, were of course done as well with compensation offered to anyone who, who joined. Um, really happy to say that the pilot feedback was really positive, but that wasn't really what was most interesting to us. What was most interesting was to understand what can we do to make the course stronger. So some feedback was that the content wasn't just at the right level and um, people in the yarning circle suggested that we have a more introductory approach. Um, participants really valued the case discussion and yarning with peers, which of course we, we did expect, but um, they really outlined that people presenting from slides, sort of like what I'm doing right now, was not um, engaging enough for a three hour presentation and that a greater focus on storytelling was required. And that the survey, um, what was still found to be, um, that they had used the words intimidating including um, like we had certain questions that maybe could be viewed as assessing participant understanding. So what did this actually mean for us? So it was sort of a light bulb moment for me because most of the feedback that we received were things that we had already discussed with our steering committee. We had had it in mind as we went to create the course, but it just emphasized that even with those things in mind, until you run a course, you won't actually know um, how that's really coming across. And if you're really hitting like hitting all the points. So we realized that we really needed to be spending a bit more time and um, work on how we structured the course to ensure that the actual environment itself was really enabling, um, that people weren't just given the opportunity to share the story, but they were actively encouraged and felt really comfortable to do so. Um, and that spacing again of the pilot implementation phase was key um, because it gave us six months to actually make, um, make a substantial number of changes. And of course, just outlining the value of qualitative discussion. Um, we wouldn't have gotten just about any of the feedback that we really did just through the surveys alone. It, the majority of our constructive feedback really did come from um, our yarning circles. So the implementation phase, um, how we actually responded to this. So we engaged further reviewers, further clinical advisors to provide additional feedback on the monitoring and evaluation methodology and the course materials. Um, but really notably, we debriefed with course facilitators. So we had debriefed with course facilitators following the initial course. Um, but after the yarning circles, we were able to get some more questions and more themes that we wanted to probe. Um, so we spoke to our course facilitators again. Um, really work to understand how we could address all of the feedback and of course provide compensation for their time in debriefing with us. And um, that led to us engaging an Aboriginal health educator, um, Shazza Taylor, who had a focus on incorporating the Aboriginal eight ways of learning pedagogy. So that's what's on the screen here. And um, we, we did receive permission before utilizing this eight ways of learning pedagogy and um, before sharing it as well. But um, ultimately, what this, I'm sorry, actually, I'll stay on this slide for a second. Um, so this is a sort of like a, a more of a method and practice of teaching that includes eight interconnected ways of learning. So these include storytelling, hands-on reflective techniques, contextualizing land links, connected to community, use of symbols and metaphors, visual learning, a deconstruct, reconstruct approach, um, and the use of non-sequential but connected concepts. And really it's a very contextual way of learning and it's focused not just on the content, but on the way that, that you are learning. And it highly values a sharing of knowledge between participants rather than just sharing um, you know, from the presenter. So 
I'll try and I didn't I was going to check what time I started talking um so I don't know how long I've been speaking for but um five minutes okay I can do that um so I'll just do this high level but um basically we we looked at all of these eight ways of learning we spoke a lot with the Aboriginal health educator and what was great is that she didn't tell us what to change she just spoke to me a lot um, she spoke to our steering committee a lot. We had really active, like really fantastic conversations that led to us just really kind of um, changing the way that we were encouraging story sharing. So as I said, it wasn't just that we gave them an opportunity to, to share their story, but it was, we really focused the course around people sharing their story. We ensured we had connection to land. 15 minutes of each session were devoted to, um, to outline the land that you're on, the land that you're from, who your mob is, um, and really encouraging rapport. Um, it, we, we always brought it back to community. So if we said anything, it was always asking the question, what does this actually mean for you and your community? How are you going to take this back to community? What are we going to do in practice? Um, and um, this is sort of more abstract and I probably don't have time to talk through it, but the kind of learning maps and the deconstruct, reconstruct approach. So really presenting themes early, constantly revisiting them, getting into detail and just bringing things back and having it be very like, very flowy kind of conversation around these themes. Um, the M&E framework was also changed in response to this. Um, notably, we moved to have one time point only. So rather than doing pre post and three month post, we just did one time point. It allowed us to ensure that we didn't have any kind of issues around um, how much data we had, because we were having not quite enough, num not high enough numbers um, with the need to have matched data. Um, and we just kind of reframed some of our questions to ensure that they worked at a one time point um, survey. So. We then ran the course in June, but we were still learning. There was still something that just wasn't, we weren't quite there. And I guess it's sort of like if I changed um, and I just said to everyone, I'm just gonna spend the rest of my just presentation asking you questions and hope that you respond to me and that's what we're gonna do. Um, you're probably going to get a little bit of silence. And we had a lot of awkward silence in that June course. Um, but um, we were able to speak to our facilitators again because that was just key all the time was speaking to our facilitators, looking at the yarning circle feedback. And we realized that what we could do was change from more of a presentation approach where they would be asking questions to the audience and change it to be more like a panel discussion um, without being a panel discussion. So you'd have at least three facilitators in every course. We have the questions normally posed to the audience got reposed to other people. So I might be asking Troy a question instead of asking the audience. Um, and then they'd, we'd be able to have that discussion and we'd get through the course content because our answers would kind of align with the presentation notes. But what that meant was that we eliminated silence and people naturally felt really comfortable with that and were able to start asking questions. And we had just fantastic um, amounts of engagement in our July and November courses. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I won't go, I'll, I'll just say we, it, it, we had really, really great findings. Um, notably, um, every respondent said they were actively, they felt actively in, encouraged to participate in the course. 100% of respondents said that the speakers dem demonstrated cultural safety and the vast majority of people strongly agreed or agreed that their confidence um, had improved, that they had a clear ideas of how they were actually going to use this information um, in their sessions. I'll just say as a summary from the yarning circles, basically, um, all of the kind of areas for improvement from that initial December pilot, we felt based on the feedback had been addressed, which was um, really great to see. Um, for recommendations, um, just to, to provide a few, I would suggest um, considering Aboriginal pedagogies and really education. It doesn't need to be eight ways, but some, something similar maybe. And again, not necessarily Aboriginal health educators, but engaging with someone with a similar experience, someone who can help you to, to work with your steering committee um, to really figure out the best approach. A need for storytelling, not just offering the opportunity, but encouraging it actively and demonstrating it through your speakers. Um, CQI, um, the pilot was so crucial for us. Um, and that ongoing, like after every course, where are we at talking to our um, speakers and making the course stronger. And um, yarning circles or some other form of culturally appropriate qualitative interviewing um, really gave us the information that we needed and surveys alone would not have done that. And our facilitators um, just absolutely instrumental. There's no way we would have gotten that feedback or been able to figure out how to practically change the course without our facilitators. 
Um, I actually probably won't really go into this because Troy um, and Emma gave an outline, but basically um, able to look at kind of scaling this up, um, adapting it to other disease areas, the same kind of approach and making sure though that any kind of ongoing education is really done as a partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Islander communities um, and the organizations and as much as possible that we are led by those people. Thank you. If anyone has any questions. Thank you, Phoebe. It's so great to hear about that process. Um, and thanks for sharing those recommendations. Um, I'm sure everyone can take something from that particular presentation. So we still have, um, we're going to give another probably 10, 15 minutes. Um, we'll we'll uh, eat into the next session a little bit and just push back lunch. Sorry, everyone. Um, hopefully you're not starving because we did have a bit of a late start. Uh, so I want to offer the opportunity for people in the audience to ask our lovely panel here questions about any of their programs or here we go. Thank you, Jackie. We'll go Judy and then Mary. Thank you, um, Judy from the Bennett. Uh, my question's for Phoebe. Um, I think that was a fantastic example of how you actually used your evaluation process in your pilot phase to actually, it sounds like quite substantially, change your course. So I wanted to say that was awesome to see because we don't see enough of that uh, in a lot of our work. But I was also curious about the learnings that you applied to this course. It struck me that many of those would apply to other training courses that ASHAM might run that might include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island participants, but also non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So I was curious about if you have plans to do that and if there are things that you learned from this process that might be applied elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, uh, for sure, after pretty much after all of our courses, what we often do with our courses is every three months, six months, a year, maybe more frequent depending on the course and how new it is, look at our evaluation findings and speak to our division and figure out what we can be changing and kind of sharing those learnings. We did develop an evaluation report, a pretty substantial one, which is also publicly available if anyone would like it, that has some of these recommendations and speaks a bit more about the online delivery format as well. Um, but from those, we had a lot of conversations internally. And I think that we are kind of moving a little bit more to that approach, especially with online delivery of trying to have things more, asking people questions, trying to kind of cut our content down. We have um, a really fantastic medical educator, Shuri Bennett, who works with us, who um, is on a mission to cut text out of our slides and to, to change things to be um, more discussion focused. So I think that with this course, um, was obviously our priority and, and that was done for this. And it's really um, it, it's really been kind of reflected in the work with the Bulga Nauru uh, Medical Aboriginal Corporation too. But for our other training, I think it is, um, we are looking at that, but it may not be quite as um, much of a change initially as some of our other courses. Over to you, Mary, sorry. Um, my question is for Troy. I'm, I'm wondering if you, the project you did at Bulgar Nuru built off previous work, similar work that was done there by Simon Graham like a few years ago and, and how we make programs like that sustainable when the resources that we need to do them might not be sustainable or not might not be ongoing. Yeah, good, good question. And yes, it, in, in a way, I guess it's um, interlinked with some of the work that Simon done up there. Um, I think was it the Strive Project or um, Shima, um, one of them. Um, yeah, so it, it, it is and there has been um, continued impact from um, them studies. Um, you know, we had the Gredit tool up there many years ago as well as part of that study. Um, and, and a lot of that project was a, a passive data extraction I'm not sure if it had a large CQI approach to it, um, but they did go back and feed back at, at intervals throughout the year back to the staff um, on, on how their testing and treatment coverage rates were, um, I guess, tracking. So definitely building on um, not only work in that space, but um, some of the, as Emma mentioned, I think some of the other ad hoc CQI activities um, that the organisation done. Um, knowing the organisation quite intimately, um, um, I know over the last six years, they've had a massive shift in um, training staff to even do internal audits against their quality management systems and the like. So um, it's also building on that and and the likes and other CQI activities. They've had sort of stop go with the utilization. And it's just, I think, having the, the um, technical and the clinical expertise and administrative expertise to, um, you know, write up a PDCA, you know, um, 
actually implement it, you know, check it and then, you know, redoing it again to retest to see if the change you made is, um, you know, having the right impact and if it's, um, I guess, achievable again as well. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Any other questions from the audience? Encouraging anyone that hasn't yet asked a question. Amanda? And obviously, Mark, if you're feeling like it. I think you asked the most questions yesterday. So. Um, this is just for the It's Your Right campaign. I'm just wondering, so yesterday we had a bit of discussion about the campaign being quite short and the resources being really useful post the sort of main campaign time. I'm wondering, for Queensland, we missed a bit of that Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander burst of things. So I'm wondering, is there still resources available that um, we can utilise to carry on um, if we're going to communities like Rockhampton or Mount Isa, for example, are the two that jump into my mind? <laughs> Um, look, I, I think we're currently discussing how we can have the continuation of the Itch Your Right campaign, i.e. looking at the point of care testing rollout, um, and not just the Archos, but the more broader um, sites within within um, that campaign. Um, so um, I, I can't say exactly um, what we can do in regards to the cost or if we have funds to go back to Enigma. It's quite expensive to have that um, production side of things done through an, an advertising agency. And Emma might want to add to this. Um, so yeah, I can't really say if that will happen. And um, if there's opportunity to come back and, um, you know, with the new message, and as I mentioned that Queensland missed out on, um, have their logo and that attached to them, but um, Em might want to talk to that as well. Yep. So this question's relevant for South Australia, Northern Territory as well. So the new messages that we got through in I suppose you could call it the second round of the Aboriginal burst, they've all been sent through to your organisation in the A3, A4 poster size. But in terms of the advertising assets, that's where we'd need further money to put in if we did another round of advertising. Yep, they were all supplied. There's more. <laughs> Is there more? We'll have to keep talking. <laughs> and even rolling the campaign out, um, to non-peer organisations. You know, we've got um, a strong voice and we want to maintain the essence of that peer focused and how we, um, you know, stay true to that co-design process and rolling that out to, you know, just your local GP practice, for example. Any other questions from the room? I'm going to ask one for Colin. Um, you had experience in so the co-design aspect and also the campaign rollout. Um, and did you get some direct feedback from community about the campaign? And can you share us a little bit about that? Um, so I work for the Institute for Indigenous Health and my care coordinator there. Um, we work across uh, 20 sites, uh, member, five member services, 20 sites. We cater to 34,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members across um, Southeast Queensland. So we have a really high population for people across that. Um, I was actually doing outreach out to uh, Kabulcha and um, there was a, a, a It's Your Rights uh, campaign poster, um, a picture up on the thing. Um, the young fellow that was in the back of the car, probably about five or six years old, said, oh, look, there's some deadly artwork up on the, the poster. Um, the two people in the car had actually participated in the, uh, in the surveys and it was really good. They said, oh, I did that. We did that. And it was really good. It resonated with the young fellow. It actually started a conversation and it was the, um, the, the no shame. And it resonated with that young fellow straight away. So they seen the, uh, the Aboriginal uh, design and then um, the dad was it an uncle able to yarn about what exactly the story was behind it because it was actually in that um, other part too. So, and it actually I, I would have been really good if we could have got it out to Sherberg and all of that as well, because um, we have different PHNs obviously. And, um, you know, sometimes they silo uh, each stuff. So it'd be good if um, we could have rolled it out across uh, everywhere because a lot of the, when I took that, um, the surveys out to community out there, it really resonated with them. And it was a, a message that they would really, really like to have so that the elders could pass it down to their kids when they're a little bit too ashamed to yarn to their local GP because in the AMS, you know, they're related to everyone. So it would have been a good uh, way to, um, the messaging um, was directed to the peer worker at um, Quinn, which was Isha, 
So even just a phone call over the, the you know, just having a phone, having a yarn with um, Isha would have been able to open up, um, you know, if they've had a custodial setting, some um, Dorit would have got the bloods. Um, the nurse practitioners are uh, bloody amazing as well. So um, nurse practitioner Mary Fennick would have been able to script them. So like all like virtual health, so that, and then they can post it out or uh, send the scripts into their local um, pharmacist, which is a special order and it's overnight. So from ProVout, instead of waiting four weeks for an appointment with a doctor, and it's just all from that, um, from the posters. Wow. So, and it's literally um, just breaking down the barrier straight away. And, and the fact that it resonated with the young people to start those conversations, that's a preventative measure as well. So yeah. just even going into talking about that and then just taking that shame away too. So um, dad was able to say, you know, well, I've had hep C and I've done the treatment. And then I call him the back for saying, well, I haven't had a C treatment, but a lot of the time I'll just, uh, <clears throat> I call it other ways in too. So, um, they're a little bit shame about their um, if they are an injector, mm -hmm. and um, they will just say, "I'll just say, you know, like other ways, and just make out you got a tattoo in jail or something like that." And then they were like, "Oh yeah, I just go to the doctor and just say that." <laughs> and then what are they going to do? Look at your ass? No. <laughs> um, I'd just like to add to that. I think um, I, I did mention in our talk, but I think one of the I don't think um one of the strengths I think of the campaign is that um you know the itch all right. I really believe that that resonates with the Aboriginal community as well. Like we've been most of Australia's first rights-based sort of population, you know, land rights, social justice rights, you know, and all of these rights that, um, you know, we've sort of had a, um, you know, develop that platform for. So I think that sort of resonates with, um, you know, our community and the, the thing is the testing and seeing if the sector, i.e. Kim Gates in the room here, um, if they they believe that, you know, we can use this messaging um, or, or does the messaging need to be a little bit softer within the walls of our member services that, you know, provide a, a continuum of services across the life continuum. So right from antenatal through to end of life and, um, you know, um, just using it as a hypothetical, but, you know, might, some of our AMS might not like, you know, get clear on the gear in their, in their um, waiting rooms or the likes, but this is the stuff that we need to explore with, with our membership on the reference group as well. Thanks, Ray. Any other questions? Hello, I have a question for you, Troy. Um, so you had, you provided like two recommendations or reflections that really spoke to me. One was on um, the prison transition to community programs and the other being NSEPs um, within prison settings. Um, is, is this part of your work plan to like advocate um, to like higher people, like high levels of being around that and funding? Yeah, look, there, I guess there's um, multiple um, touch points of advocacy that's um, been embedded in ECA's advocacy strategy, um, which Freya has led. So um, that's part of our advocacy um, policy platform um, at that higher strategic level. Um, you, you know, maybe not also, but, you know, whenever there's an opportunity, you know, I always like to include it when we have the right audience, um, but, you know, ha happy to work with people. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, made comments to the national sick strategy that you know nacho um develop a package and it was you know so pleasing to hear that aqua have taken that position yesterday to finally develop a, a package to go to um their member services and say look addressing myths and uh, misconceptions of what nsps bring to community and um and the like so uh, that was really um I, I suppose quite refreshing to hear that yesterday um and i, I think is a most probably the the first um, state and territory affiliate of Nacho that I've heard of taking that position. So I um, would like to commend you guys on that as well. Um, yeah, so we, we think that, you know, Nacho can also play um, a much stronger role in having a position around NSPs, um, but also maybe, um, you know, partnering with appropriate organisations like ourselves and Asham and the likes and, and um, you know, their membership and their affiliates to put a package together to, um, you know, that people can take to their boards, um, to their senior managers, um, you know, from my experience, I know we still get a lot of opposition from NSPs and it just shows the stigma in some of our workforce, both our non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal workforce. Um, you know, where, where my family are from in Bunjalung region, we've got a very strong Christian influence um, in community. Um, a lot of our senior Aboriginal health workers are against injecting drug use. Um, you know, a lot of our non-Aboriginal practice managers and senior nurses are against um, you know, providing needles to people um, and and it's all built on their myths and misconceptions and misunderstandings they had of, of NSPs. 
Thanks. I'm sure Troy could keep talking on that topic. So maybe grab him at lunch. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we might transition to the next session. So thanks to the panel and thank you, Troy, for that session. Um, thank you, Colin, Emma and Phoebe.